Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Sorry about that dodgy start there. Uh, welcome to the sixth of the Lawful Remedies with the Clever Clogs waiting in the wings. Uh, this time, the lovely Karen Dodd is not actually in the studio. At least I don't think she is. No, uh, I'm over here. No, no she's over here. Over here, here she is. Hang on, Karen. I've got another member of the panel just coming in. Here we go. Hello, Karen, and how are you? Hello, I'm very well, thank you. I'm over on the Isle of Wight, Richard, so I'm very well. So, yeah, oh, missing lots got... next to you. Uh, have you got nice weather on the Isle of Wight? Of course, yeah. I can see the sea. I was in it yesterday. It was a bit nippy. But yeah. Blimey. Uh, yeah. Is that, what, what happened? Did you fall off the ferry or something? No, 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 no. no. I just went for one of those wild swims, they call it. I don't know why they call it wild, so, you know, unless you're going, ah, because it's really cold. But mm. um, no, it's very healthy. It's the end thing, isn't it, to go in the sea when it's freezing cold? Is it? Can bear it? Yeah, it's very healthy because you. Well, I have to say, my dad, my dad used to do that. I mean, he was in his in his eighties when he snuffed it, but uh, he used to go until about three or four years until uh, I think about seventy nine, eighty. He did it every day. He lived near the coast, and sometimes it would just be to wade up to his knees. But um, and at one point, a wave knocked him over, and he said, "That's it. I can't do it anymore." <laughs> Bless him. So, well, but... I don't like the waves, yeah. It, 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 yeah, because if it's cold, that's one thing. Mm. But when the waves come over, it makes you very, very, very cold. But, yeah, it's a good thing to do. Very good for the immune system. Well, we have an audience gathering. This is a live show. And if you're watching the rerun, obviously, uh, there's a chat that you can look at as you go through and see all the conversations. But you can comment after the show in the normal comment box, but we can't answer those questions as easily because of the time delay. However, Karen, uh, we have Waiting in the Wings, mm. wonderful selection of panellists. Now, this time, the, every time somebody speaks, their face will appear on the screen. So when you introduce the panellists, we'll, we'll need to have a quick chat to each one so that we can see who they are. So over to you, Karen. So, yes, um, tonight... Tonight we have two Garys, hopefully they're both on board. Gary Spills is here, because we were chatting to him early. So shall I just say who we're going through and then they, then they go and chat? Is that how you want me to do this? Um, yeah, just say hello to each one as we go, so hello, that we Gary. can get to see them. Right. Hi there. Where are you? Oh, Gary, Hi, Gary. This Gary. Yeah. Oh. There we <laughs> hello. hello, Gary. How are you? Yeah, not so bad, not so bad. I've uh, uh, been, as I usually do, just re reading and researching and... Uh, helping uh, the people in Wakefield again, so it's uh, it's all been hands on deck really, and I've uh, been uh, discovering some interesting things from the uh, Bill of Rights as well, uh, uh, coming down to the authority that Parliament have, uh, and uh, um, their kind of how can we say their enforcement on society. Wow, busy lad. Uh, usually. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all seem to be getting more and more busy all the time at the moment with so much going on being pushed upon us. Mm -hmm. um, well, so this is uh, no, Gary too, yeah. Gary Fraun. Hello, Gary. Gary. Joined us, Hello. yes, Gary Fraun. How are you? Good, good. How are you? Thank you for joining us this week. I hope all is well. I know you've got stuff going on, but thank you for joining us. I've got an awful lot going on, but yeah, 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 it's... um. Challenging days for all of us, I think. I think everyone seems to be under it. Um, me and my friends, we all believe there's some kind of spiritual attack going on. Really? Um, that's that's for another um, conversation. Yeah, because everyone I know who's who's doing the heavy lifting um, seems to be under a lot of pressure in various different ways. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. It's, it's they say like microcosm, macrocosm, don't they? What's going on, you know, inside is also going, going on outside. So above as below, and I, I think everybody's really feeling the pinch, especially if you're on this uh, journey of sovereignty, challenging. Yeah. yeah. Well, can, can I just say, Karen, basically, you know the understanding of as above, so below. Mm. Do you know where the or what the origin of that statement is? Do tell. Well, the actual uh, the original text says uh, it it is up from the bottom as it is down from the top. So there's nowhere is it mentioned as above, so below. That was an inversion of the original text. Thank you. So every day is a learning day, isn't it, on this show? Yeah. Take notes, Richard. <laughs> and, well, I know. The thing is, you can't keep up with it. <laughs> no, we can't. So we've got um, Gary. Shall I say who else? We've got Jill, who's our happy story. So Jill joined us before because she's actually one that's walking the talk. 
And I think it's really inspirational when we get people on board that have done some work and have positive results. And Jill can't be with us that long because she's got to whiz off to another um, of course. But Jill's with us tonight. Hello, Jill. Hi. Yes, I, I'm on board with the, you know, the energy is being very strange at the moment and very intense. And uh, everyone I speak to seems to be going through some some kind of shifts and changes and traumas. And um, this last week I've been um, helping my uh, one of my relatives with um, with a whole backlog log of debts that I didn't know anything about. But he's basically buried his head in the sand, you know, just a youngster and not being able to deal with it and so on. So transpires he's got a CCJ, another one on the way, and a whole pile of debt collector's letters. And I've just been like lying awake at night, oh my God, you know, it's like I've taken on the worry for him. But um, I've been learning a lot because I didn't know anything about how to get a CCJ set aside or anything before. But I think one of the key points, and I may be completely wrong here, is the fact that he never received... Um, the, the notices because they don't actually send you anything with registered or recorded posts that you have to sign for and having a communal hallway as he has he hasn't actually received a lot of this stuff so I think that's possibly quite you know, one of our angles to ask the thing to be set aside but that's been my focus for the last few days and I've just been doing nothing but sitting at the keyboard bashing away sort of ah. Getting well, well, well done for helping you. I think that if I may just say here, this is a really valid point because you've been helping him, which is great. And you guys, you clever clubs are helping, you know, the public. But also it's really important to remind ourselves that this is a sovereign journey and we all have to really do the work ourselves, maybe alongside somebody. But we have to get what's going on individually, Absolutely. independently, you know, so that we can stand up and, and um, speak out for ourselves. I've made that quite clear yeah. to him. I've said, you know, look, if I do this and help dig you out of this, you have to promise that you're going to get on board and learn learn this stuff yeah, and go on courses. Yeah, there's no, short, there's no shortcut. There's no, no, shortcut. no, there isn't. No, you have to do it yourself. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks, Jill. Um, also, Richard, I think we have Pete Wilson. I saw him earlier. He's joined us already. Hello, Pete. Hello, Pete. Hi, how are you doing? Yeah, we're doing very well. You're in a hotel, I understand. I am, yeah. I'm down actually to have a... a well, they would call it a law lecture, but I'm here to do a, a lecture on some uh, some more debt uh, legislation. So we keep sharpening the axe, we keep sharpening the tools. So uh, for sure, Jillian, uh, if you want help with anything to do with the N244 about how to actually set aside a, a CCG as well, just give me a shout or I'll help you get the forms filled out if you need any help for, your, you uh, for your family member. There. Thank you. Um, just to, I'm sorry, I, I will try not to be too silly in today's show, but um, Pete, um, it does look like you have a sun lamp directly above your head. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll actually try to switch the mode. Do you want me to switch it off? No, no, just not at all. Hello to actually help, you know, like, you know, we, we've got a similar uh, hairstyle, so we need to show it off, you know, let's we do. not be shy. No, quite right. I thought you were in like a beam me up Scotty kind of contraption. <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> Brilliant. I've been beamed up years ago. Um, and we we were to be joined by Mick Stock. So I don't know, Richard, if he's joined us. He did get the message with a thumbs up, but I don't know if he's if he's on because I'm not in your studio with you, so I can't see. No, he's not not um, appeared as yet. But if he comes on, I've got a monitor just to the side of me, and I keep an eye on that. Um, so if he comes on, I will let him in. Um, so I suppose um, it's all down to you, the lovely viewer. If you've got questions, there are a few questions out there already. Karen is going to be scouring them. Uh, we have the lovely Julia who is also watching. And, and if there's anything via WhatsApp, she's sending me messages as well. She's moderating in the chat just to make sure there's no naughty stuff going on. Um, so uh, shall we get cracking? Yeah, let his, his question to start with. Um, so, yes, Richard has asked you to put question at the beginning of any comments so that we um, they, they stand out. So, Doug wants to know if he's got time to make coffee. Of course you have. Um, and then Stuart said, I sent my council tax bill with a do not consent. Then I came here to Wales in our caravan. Oh, no question. 
to relax and worry about it later in the year. Well, that's quite a nice thing to, uh, to hear. Thank you, Stuart. Is that, I mean, the question there would be, is that a sensible thing to... To relax, yeah. When to you relax and, and go away. And then at the last bit was to, you know, come back to it some time later in the year. Is that really a sensible thing to do? Is any, any of our... No, I, I, I think you've got to, you've got to be in their sandpit. You've, you've got to, you, you, you can't, you can't rebut it in your mind, but not actually do it physically. You, um, you need to, um, you need to create that joinder to get things started to explain your position. Yeah, because you might come back and find that bailiffs are already knocking at the door or something. Or have already been. Yeah. Or have already been. Is that possible? Can they? I mean, are they actually allowed to go in if the, if the property is empty? And it depends how long uh, how long you're going to be out of the property for. Because if they come first time, you're not in. The, they are supposed to leave you a notice that they've been and nobody mm. there. And then in the second time, they can actually bring the police with them. And, and from what I'm, I understand, they can breach. Gosh, that does seem. Um, I mean, if you're on holiday. You know, you've gone or you're working away for a, a month or something. This is Some this is are. why this is why where Gary said you've got to engage them straight away. It's best to do it. It's best to send them the conditional offer based on uh, the terms that you're going to actually say. I need these things answering, and until these things are answered, basically we're at, we're in dispute. Hmm. That's yeah. yeah well, it, it's, a, it's 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 a it's a um it's a Conditional acceptance provided you can provide the following, and then you've got them. Then you're in. Then you're in communication. Um, mm. But but you've got to you've got to do that. You, you can't just shut the door and ignore them. Um, so you, the other thing is they break the law all the time. They break the law all the time. I know incidents where police that have attended with bailiffs um, turns out they weren't police. Uh, I've been involved in a situation last year where. Um, we had security guards running around an estate um, which the police gave them access to, but it turns out these guys with Melanoirs and Alsatians uh, all tooled up, um, basically managing the estate so no one can enter it. We found out that basically the bailiffs only had door licences for clubs. I saw, and yet yeah, they were yeah. running around with dogs. So, and that's that's normal. So... Um, if anyone is surprised by that, then then obviously these learning curves can be quite uh, steep ones. Um, mm -hmm. I'm also I'm I'm of the of one incident I know of that, as I say, the police were not police; they were dressed as police, and and these guys get on with the bailiffs. There's a relationship as well, so it's it's levels of deceit uh, that are constant. Um, we did get them in the end by. What we did was we basically said, if you don't get off the estate, we'll ring the home office, we'll have your dogs destroyed, we'll have your vehicles taken away because you didn't have them. We checked their MOTs, we checked their tax, they were sawned off the road. So we'd done, we'd done all the work, as it were. Uh, it was a two-day, one-night standoff. Uh, police did attend, a uh, police helicopter as well. Um, but basically we said, this is a civil matter, go away. You know, you're dismissed. And uh, we dealt with it in our way, and uh, the bailiffs ran with their tail between their legs. Um, but ultimately, the dogs weren't destroyed, which I thought was going to be the unfair part of it. So, mm. um, yeah, they went away. Um, but but the, the the lies and the deceit are off the chain. Mm. And so, I mean, now that I mean, you you mentioned people dressed up as police, as in you know the um, yeah. impersonation mob, uh, the IPO yeah. mob, as it was in a. In a 1950s comedy film, Ealing Comedy, I remember, with a lot of uh, good old stars. But, but people are really actually dressing up as policemen to do that and to getting away with yep. it. Yep, that yep. That is... So I you want to I... see their warrant cards, you need to take a photo of their warrant cards and, uh, you need, and you need to contact the police station that they're in. I mean, don't forget, yeah. the police have their own policies to follow. They have to show you their ID card, they have to tell you their number and they have to give you the, their name. Unless so the they're person. arresting you, unless they're arresting you under terrorism, and in terrorism, they all they have to do is give you their number, their collar number, and then you've got to bear in mind that each uh, police force, and I use that word carefully, um, they have repeat numbers, 
So you need to know the locality of that collar number to recognise that officer. And, uh, and that's when you start catching them out. Yeah, and presumably that's um, a quite... Is that a custodial offence if you're dressed up as a policeman? Well, they seem to get away with it. Um, Don't they? Um, us members of the public, or they call us mops, that's what the police term is for members of the public. Um, we've got to deal with a mop. Um, their attitude Shame. these days is, is shocking. I mean, when I was a lad, which unfortunately is quite a few years ago, um, the local off the local Bobby, everyone knew him, you know. And, yes. and if you were in trouble, you could go and get help. The police are the last piece of people I'd, I'd contact if there was a problem. The last yes. piece. Which is a, a big worry when you're in a, a difficult situation. Um, Karen, how are we doing with the well, questions? We've got a question here for, for Peach. Um, uh, well, it's a sovereign Pete, but we've got the other Pete here. So let's see if the other Pete can answer it. What is the document Pete said we need to prove real ownership of a car? So I don't know if you can help us with that one, Pete. It's Certificate of Manufactured Origin. It's, well, it's, called, it's called a Certificate of Manufactured Origin. Does that come from Gary, by the way? That did, that did actually come from Gary. I was going to say, Pete managed to say do that without moving yeah, his Yeah, we've got their friend Twitter going on. But well, that's great. So, but that's the answer that yeah. they're looking for. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. through my voice, through my voice. But yeah, yeah, totally correct. Certificate of Manufactured Origin. We've actually just been trying to trace that now by doing like a, what they call a V888, which asks for any other information from the DVLA. However, they are um, denying everybody that they're the existence of a certificate, don't know what they're talking about, what is a certificate of origin, et cetera, et cetera. We've just been trying to do that, funnily enough. So, you know, um, that, that I wouldn't call it a low deal title because that bears to actual, uh, like, uh, property, as in uh, bricks and mortar. But, yeah, that's what they mean. So it's uh, to the true ownership of the actual vehicle. And it's like, like what he said. Well, uh, Can I... one, one, way of, one way of getting around that is, is you've got to understand the terms fee simple. Everything is contract, offer acceptance and consideration. Now, in property, I'm a surveyor, like a few people know, there's two types of, of, um, of, of uh, occupation. And I, I, again, you've got to be careful with that word because only a standing army can occupy a space. But you have fee simple, absolute in possession and term of years absolute. Term of years absolute is freehold. Um, fee simple absolute in possession is leasehold, and it's the same with a with with a a, a conveyance or a vehicle. Um, you need to ask for the fee simple uh, certificate of ma manufactured origin, and then they can't get out of that one. Hmm. How, how could you do that with something like a property, though, a house or something? Can you? Because you don't manufacture a house, do you? Well, I suppose you do in a way. Well, well somebody does. Well. Yeah, somebody does. Well don't, for, well, don't forget, fee simple absolutely goes into the stamp act and the bills of exchange. So the the, the, the term fee simple is really important if you're going to start looking into uh, how money's created, um, how banks create money using bills of exchange to discharge debt. Uh, it's it all revolves around fee simple. Can I let me ask a question then? It, I mean, it all seems to be that we have to buy these cars which are manufactured by somebody who puts them together. But if you make your own car, and I've seen people driving sheds and sofas, and they've managed to get them licensed, presumably they've manufactured them from all the parts, brought them together, so that then there's no question that they own them. Is that no, right? No. But yeah, yeah. But again, you've got to be careful because anything with a serial number on it um, ha has has a manufacturer behind it. Right. So if you so you'd have to actually manuf make your own engine out of using a lathe and all those various bits. So in theory. No, in theory. Oh right. Which is not what what you know, Mrs. Miggs from Thirty Two Acacia Avenue. In case you're popping in for coffee, could possibly do. Although she might do, she might be cleverer than we think. Yeah, you know, you never know what Mrs. Miggs is all about. Should we go for another question? Yes, please. So this is a good one. Um, how and well, how can I claim back a direct debit from the bank? Says Mark. Ask Mark. 
how can you claim a direct debit back from the bank? And why would you? I'll throw that one in. Hmm. What would be... Who would want to answer that? I mean, presumably you well, can... What, what, why would you would be the point, though. Why would you? Because, like, there are... Oh, my... I don't want to get too nasty here, but, like, at the end of the day, there's, there's a lot of different scenarios going on behind the scenes where you can't just say, why would I get a direct debit reclaim from the bank? Hmm. If it was, like, something, like, you've been paying for a direct debit that you didn't realise, which I know... I don't want to go down that route of like what they're talking about, but like uh, say for instance there was a direct debit set up, say a double one or a different one, you can actually get it reclaimed for every single debit, even if it's like you know a hundred years. Obviously, I'm exaggerating, but you can get that back. But what these people may be talking about is something exactly different, whereas they're trying to get it back for the likes of council tax, etc., 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 which is a different kettle of fish. So, yes, it's very easy to get a claim back for a direct debit, but if you want to actually get it claimed back for something you've paid, like a council tax, etc., don't think you can do it without somebody coming up and kicking in your door and saying, right, oh, come on, let's go talk about this now, about the council tax or any other utility bill, you know, because they're going to come and ask you about it. I'm not saying they might be right, but they're definitely going to come and ask you about it. So don't believe the people that say, you can just go and do the direct debit, reclaim it all. You've got all your money. You're totally fine. No one's ever going to ask you about it again because I'm telling you what, they're coming to see you. I did have a gentleman on the show who did talk that through, um, but he did fail. He did say at the end that you st he still had the debt. He got all the money back and they just said, OK, you've, you've got 4000 or 10000 whatever it was. He says, but you still owe us the money. You've effectively not paid us. That, that's exactly what it is, you see. I mean, right, What you can claim back a direct debit that was actually incorrectly made, right? right? So you can do that and you can actually get it back and that's completely fine. And I know what they're saying, by the way, about like reclaim it back by, you know, for the council tax and all of that. But you can't just do that and not expect them to come back and ask for something back. Right. So don't think it's as easy as what some people are actually trying to tell you and sell you these things. Right. If you want to claim it back, you do what you want. I'm not telling anybody what to do. But if you do claim it back and it's something like council tax or a utility bill, they're going to come and ask you some questions about it. So if you can't stand on what you're actually asking back for, then don't do it in the first place. Don't think yeah. they're not coming back after you because they're not. So, so, Pete, would you advise people not to try and claim back their direct debit for council tax? I don't advise people to do anything. But what I would say, if I was sitting there doing that, then I would not do it. But you can do what you like. Okay. I mean, I suppose the only way you would... One way, not one way, one proper way of doing it would be if the council have said, oh, we've made an error... And then you could go to the bank and say, OK, they have actually admitted to making error. Then you could claim it back because every party is then saying they're in agreement with you. Well, is, yeah, obviously, that, that's yeah. totally fine. But, yeah, you know, I the mean, question, unlikely, but... you know, what what I get is like this question's come up. Like, Can I do this? That I think I've heard of a direct debit reclaim for yes. uh, all the utility, utility bills or council tax. You know, and they said, well, look, you know, you do what you want, but like, don't expect them to go, oh, sorry, sorry, it's all good, you take it from there. Yeah. If you have been in a contract with them, which you are, because you're all in tacit consent anyway, then they're going to come and ask for it. So if, you've, if you use the direct debit, the direct debit is there to set you up to protect you from fake direct debits and mistakes. Now, it could be fake, it could be a mistake, it could be a disagreement with council tax utility bills. That's between you and them. But, you know, don't think you can just do it and get no blowback whatsoever because you have to deal with what you create. If you create it, you have to deal with it. Yeah, I think that's a very valid point. Um, yes. I've got a question coming. Julia's um, highlighted a question here which might be of interest from Joe and the question is my cousin has a mortgage which payments have been increased from 500 I think that's 600 100. 
£2,600 a month to £2,600 a month. Is that legal and how can she deal with it? That's a question to anybody who wishes to... Uh, and, and I think this is happening across the board, isn't it? The, uh, you know, the inflation rate or the bumped up mortgage rate is going very high. Any thoughts? Stony silence. Yeah. They must have no, had well, I tell you, the yeah. thing is, right, what they're doing, you just actually ask the question, which is the, the, the most applicable one, is it legal? And what? So if you're actually being a person, then anything they want to do to you, including that, or killing you, is legal. Right. So if you're accepting the person the legal definition of person, the Black Laws Dictionary version, their jurisdiction, as it were. A hundred percent, because, you know, the only rights that you have are the right to man. Now, if you're standing there, you know, you can call it whatever words you like, you know. I mean, some people use the word God, don't like that word whatsoever. But, I mean, you know, like at the end of the day, if you are acting in a legal realm or legal responsibility, they can do anything to you mm. because it's legal. You know, they've been stabbing and killing people with, and with this thing like for the last, what, four years or whatever it is, I don't know. But it's all legal. They tell you it's legal. You can't stop us doing it. It's legal. Turn up in the hundreds at doing this demonstration. It's not a problem. We're killing these people legally by doing this because it's all legal because the government said it's legal. Legal. Yeah. Right. Not, okay. Not legal. Not... Um, the legal society should be called the, um, the the law society should be called the legal society. So they tie us up in knots with their words. Yes, and that's one thing that we have to. I mean, it's a, it, you know the sad part is we've all been indoctrinated from school upwards, and it is you know even when you are, I mean I've been sort of hearing this for the last sixteen months, and you're still falling foul of it because of that ingrained oh mm -hmm. uh, yeah no, I'm not a person I'm a free man i'm you know living man or whatever um but then caught off guard so easily well that comes down to the bit and switch when parliament thought they were sovereign and as soon as they thought they were sovereign they thought they could make law and law obviously in the government sense is legislation mm. like saying because they actually believe they're sovereign which they can be because if there was we wouldn't have a judiciary because they would make the law yeah very good point make the, yeah make the, make the legal yeah, but that, but once again, but if they, if the government was sovereign, because it's only a theory that they're sovereign, they aren't actually sovereign. But if they were sovereign, we wouldn't need a judiciary because they would make the law. So then we wouldn't need a judiciary because they would decide whether it was right or wrong, because basically they are sovereign, so they wouldn't need a judiciary. That's why. Right. I, that's why basically it's only a theory of parliamentary sovereignty. They don't actually have it. They can never have it, especially with the agreement they made on the. On the Bill of Rights, sixteen eighty eight, because anything after that point had to ex had to exist before that point, before they made the agreement, and because they didn't, as he, this is what I was going to say about from the Bill of Rights, sixteen eighty eight, it expresses in there that Parliament assembled is only sovereign creator of law over the HM government. That's it. So that they haven't got the right to even actually uh, put legislation on the people because of the agreement they made on the Bill of Rights in sixteen eighty eight. Parliament assembled is it's, it's reading it here basically. Parliament assembled is is only the sovereign creator of law over the HM government. So the actual legislation shouldn't have ever gone out the bounds of that building, essentially. Mm -hmm. I and mean, this is the switch bait and switch because they've actually yes. made people believe they're sovereign, which they can't be. They just can't be. It just can't happen. Should we go to another question, Karen? Yeah, yeah. I was just trying to take that all in because. This is, this is so deep, isn't it? What we're learning now, and, and it's taken lifetimes and generations for them to install this into us, and we have to unravel that. And you're not just going to do that overnight. That's why I think this this taking charge of your own decisions and your own gut feeling is so important. You, there's no there's no quick fix for this. You've got to understand what what it's all about. But another question, um, okay, a straightforward one from Sarah. What to do with the notice of intended prosecution? For a speeding offence, we like that one. Well, I I did a, a speeding one um, about a year ago. Um, it was for doing twenty five miles an hour. Uh, 
yeah, I think, yeah, 20, 20 mile hour limit. And it was, I think my husband was doing 25. Um, um, I, you know, I don't really know how I did it. But I won it in the end just by, by battling it. I had masses of paperwork. Um, they kept sending more and more. And I, I challenged it, you know, through the access to the notices that I had. Um, and they, they then they sent me a huge great bundle of, of all the back correspondence and I noticed that within them all there was a set the same name that kept popping up um, but this person wore different hats you know they'd give it was a woman she'd give herself a different title on, on each one and so I started to do sort of a bit like freedom of information requests and say you know is this person the, the person that's, that's taking the, the, the prosecution against me um, or is she doing this job or is she doing this job? And then the, the nub of it was that um, when, uh, sorry, I can't remember the name of all the paperwork, but when the final thing came through for the court hearing, um, there was the, the, the name of a department and, uh, and the person that was meant to be bringing the prosecution, another name, and I did a freedom of information to... Um, the police headquarters, um, Scotland Yard, and uh, I got a reply which said, no such department and no such person exists. So I thought, hmm, okay. So I basically wrote to the court and gave them a whole list of reasons for dismissing the case and just, just laid them out from picking out all the rubbish that they'd sent me over the over the last several, several months. And it... it, it I never got a notification that it was dismissed, but I phoned the court about three months later, or I emailed them actually, and they just wrote back and said, yes, it's been dismissed. So I don't actually know, know the answer. Um, there are people, I'm sure you you will know a lot more about how to actually effectively challenge a speeding fine, you know, with, with, with quite effective notices from the beginning. But mine was a big, big long, long battle. Mm. Well, I can say I did win in the end. I mean, I, I've actually done lots of notices for PCNs and council taxes is my my biggest one that I focused on on the most. But in the last three years, I have done lots and lots of notices. I'm trying, you know, trying to learn all the time, but I haven't actually um, had any any comeback on any of them. You know, they 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 go, they just go quiet. The council tax doesn't. Do you want, do you want me to speak for a couple of minutes about council tax because I have to buzz off in a minute. Um, so I started um, challenging it, you know, when the, the whole um, psychological warfare thing came down the pipeline and somebody started talking to me about common law and, and that sort of thing and um, said that council tax was fraud and they weren't spending the money on what we thought they were spending it on. So I started to look into it more. And I started off with very, very simple notices and that was sort of one of my first ones, all in the red writing, lowercase, you know, looks a bit weird. Um, but since since then, I thought, well, you know, I'll just put it into um, a format that looks a bit more normal, if you like. And I haven't actually paid um, since uh, 21. Um, and all that happens is they, they just go quiet for months and months. And then they, they write again and tell, tell me to pay. Um, I had one enforcement officer around... He said he had a warrant and I said, can I see it, please? And he said, I don't have to show it to you. And I said, yes, you do, actually. And have you read my notice? Because I, I have notices up outside the house, you know, private property, no trespassing and all the rest of it. Anyway, he, he scuttled off. And um, then I just got the normal council tax bill. So I haven't actually had a load of aggro. My, my thing is, going back to what you were saying earlier, Gary, um, is not to ignore anything. I, I can't bury my head in the sand. So I'll always deal with it and I'll just, you know, look, look at all the different things. I found the Boycott Council Tax Group very, very helpful. There's a whole um, section in there in the files, which is called a V12, which is a whole thing to, to do with all English law. And there's a big council tax section in there and it tells you how to, you know, rebut the summons so, um, or the notice of um, liability. Um, and I've, I've done all that and just kept going with it. And it that's all I feel I can do at the moment because they're not going to go away. I think that's the thing that people have to realise. They're not going to go away. They're just going to keep coming back. But, but I don't feel I don't feel pressured by it because I don't feel that they can actually do anything. You know, they no, can't I mean, actually you, do you, anything. You, 
you've got to drop the fear. I mean, I, I today yes. I, I finally got um, uh, um, thousands of pounds off the police when they they basically stole someone's car, and um, and then they sold it and and they sold the private road number and pocketed the cash. So I've been I've been fighting that one since. Where are we? September last year. Um, and it just takes takes a lot of work, you know. Yeah. In help, I, I'm helping this guy. Um, he didn't know what to do from the outset, and he kept saying to me, "We're not going to win this. We're not going to win this." And I said, "We are. We yeah. quite simply are." Um, and you just keep going at them and going at yeah. them and going. At them. And absolutely. And I think if I could just say one more thing about the council tax this year, I've done a sort of a combination of two things. I've basically said. Um, we've written to you and your predecessor several occasions, blah, blah, blah. I sent you DSARS. You haven't answered any of it. Um, it's a legal requirement to answer it and uh, so on and so forth. And then additionally, I've used Chris Coverdale's in the same notice and said, you know, in addition to all of that, um, you know, you've, you've, you've basically waived your right to any former claim from previous years because you haven't, um, you know, responded in, in the lawful legal way. And now um, I, I'm, I'm also adding on that uh, that it's actually unlawful Julian, for us to pay tax, you know, with the Terrorism Act and Chris Chris Coverdale's sections so Julian, in there as well. So I've put the money they, into a trust they, they and I'm holding it there. Did the council accept your um, your notices? Did they give you a response to say we've actually received them? Uh, yeah, I've got a mailbox address now, and I insist that they only write there. So if they don't write there, I just send things back. And I have had well, a couple they, of yeah, yeah, have they actually acknowledged it, though, to say we have received your notices? Um, I've, I'm but, doing... Because if, if they haven't more... acknowledged if they haven't yeah. acknowledged it, you might have an hard time binding them legally because they haven't actually haven't acknowledged them. Um, I have had acknowledgement from one of the councils. I'm doing more than one council. Yes, I did get an acknowledgement. Thank you for your... Oh, uh, yeah, well, that, well, then, then, to... yeah, well, then, essentially, you've got a legally binding because you can actually take that as evidence into the court to say oh, okay. they've acknowledged that now. And because okay. they've acknowledged it, basically, they must have read through that. And actually, right. because they've read through it and acknowledged it, we've received this, then mm. they're in knowledge of it. They have first-hand knowledge. Mm -hmm. Because they have first-hand knowledge now and they've acknowledged okay. that they've got first-hand knowledge, that creates a legal bind when they go to court. Okay. Okay, but how does it actually get to court? Because they send you a notice of intended prosecution or whatever, a notice of liability. They escalate. But then they you escalate. just, but they then just you escalate, just... essentially. They'll, they'll actually go from, obviously, the administrative court. And because the, basically the like the bailiffs have come back and said, we're getting no joy from the, from the person, so we're returning the letter of authority back to the client. The client then actually applies for a CCG. So then it escalates up. So they just escalate just like we would. So you think they can apply for a CCJ even though they've got all that paperwork and they've basically, I mean, you surely can contest it on the fact that they haven't yeah, answered. Yeah, yeah, well, well, the, well, this, is what I'm saying, this is what I'm saying about the, them the acknowledging it, yeah. the acknowledgement, yeah. yeah, that's why it binds them. As soon as they're bound, you can say, well, I sent them this. They haven't answered it and they've acknowledged that they received it. So they've got yeah. first-hand knowledge of this now. And because yeah. they have first-hand knowledge, you can actually drag them in basically under subpoena because they've, you've acknowledged that you've got it. So you have to come yeah. in there and actually basically uh, actually uh, testify to the fact that <clears throat> you, we sent you this, you acknowledged it, therefore we have now got a, a, a legal contract, essentially. Yeah. So that creates the... That, that's interesting. I mean, obviously I send them, um, you know, Royal Mail special delivery and I can prove that they somebody received them. It, well, but, that's um, a plenty, that's what they call plenty. Well. That's a plenty mm -hmm. position because you're using a plenty, a pl like a plenty potential judge can do a uh, basically law of a mail, so you can actually use the crown and the tracking number to verify the document. So okay. it then basically has a, 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 a said this crown seal on it. And I, I don't know if people know this when you actually do things recorded mail, you have a sticker that goes on the front. Yeah. But you can ask the post office to put the tracking number on your document. So you're tracking uh -huh. the document, not the letter. Okay. Then the doctor, then the crown stamp is, is then basically authorizing the document. So as soon so as they you... sign for that, they've they've actually created contract with you because they're signing the contract, not the envelope. Just just on that, mm. when are you saying that they would stamp the old document so you'd you wouldn't seal the envelope at that point? You Essentially, would just... yeah. Every time I've gone to actually doing a notice, literally. 
I've gone with my document. It's basically, I put it in an envelope, but it's open. And right. I said, I need to send that basic recorded mail. They put a sticker on the front. And I said, what I need you to do is to open the, to take the document out and put the, sm- the small tracking number, because it's two. You've got a large one on the front, yeah. which you've got to put a stamp on. And then you've got a smaller one that they take off and can stick to the document. Therefore, you've had a public a, 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 a public servant seal, right. administrate the document, seal it. That is so brilliant. That, so that is, and then that is put, brilliant. And then we'll put the stamp on the front. You've got a crown stamp, so it's been sealed. So that now you have contract. As soon as they sign for that, you are signing for the envelope. They're signing for the document inside. That means okay. when you get when you get the tracking number, you can get the signature from the tracking number. Actually, get a photo, a basically a photo shot of that, and then put mm. that in the file as contract because you've signed for it, and you haven't signed for the envelope. You signed for the document inside because the tracking number, essentially, is tracking the document, not the envelope. You see, that's yeah, if, that's if, why we got you guys on here because it's if, little if nuggets wanna, like that. If you want to look into that, it's it's the um, the postal rule agreement of 1977, exactly. and, and all the information all the information's in there. Gary, it, you've, you've yeah, turned it, it, on it, your it, side. Well, it's, well, it's, <laughs> well, it's, and it's still seen as a plenipotentiary position because plenipotentiary judges basically actually do law over the post. So it's a postal. That means it's your court now. So you've actually opened yeah. the court. Hmm. So can I just clarify something? So the little bit on, you know, because I use the orange stickers because the silver ones are really expensive. The little bit that you peel off, you're saying to put that on the document. Not you. In, not you. No, not you. Get them not, to do it. Yeah, because they they can't give you it back. Once they've took it, they can't give you it back. But that's why they administrate it for you. Okay. Because I usually stick it on my copy. Mm. Yeah, but you can take a photo. You can take a photo of that. It's not a problem taking a photo. And to say, you just put it up to a glass so I can take a photo to show the tracking number is on the document. Mm. So you can do that as well. That's not a problem. But they'll say, but as soon as they take it off you, they cannot, by law, give you that back. Because Gary kindly advised me to do this with my document the other week, which I did. And at the post office, they did think I was a little bit bonkers, but I just said, look, I've, I've been asked to do this. And she just went ahead and did it. And it was fine, fine. And, and, and the reply I got from the council was really a step back. You know, they're not, not quite as aggressive because they had um, threatened to uh, send out a warrant, um, send me to prison, fine me £5,000 and um, break it, have access to my property. And I said, you can't do that through this letter. And then the reply I got was... Um, I think you misread our communication. I wasn't threatening to come into your property, but we still would like to visit you. So it's still <laughs> ongoing, but it was it was a step yeah, backwards. Yeah, well, yeah, they actually found they've got a conscience after things like that because it's stamped by the crown, and because it's stamped yeah. by the crown, the actual and then administrated by a public servant because you didn't administrate that, they did. Yeah. And like I say, and that gives it a little bit more weight when it comes to when it's, it's um, passed to them to go, oh, hang about. They've, they've got my signature. The, the document's been tracked, and. Essentially, we uh, if we acknowledge this as well, that then we're bound by it. Yeah. Simple as. And but like I said, but that that's what I've done with every document. And if I, the fight against the bailiffs I'm having, essentially, I've been holding them off for eighteen months. They haven't been round once, basically, because I keep doing this to them, and they go like, oh, uh, well, we're not going to be doing this now. It's like, well, yes, you are, because that's what you're threatened in three or four emails and two bloody texts that this was mm. going to happen. But now you're stepping back a bit, and it's like when I've asked for the uh, deed of assignment or the letter of uh, the letter of authority, they're like, mm. oh, "We can't show you that because I need to see that." Mm. And then basically, because I'm keep doing this to them, they, they keep saying, "Oh, we're going in a protracted conversation." It's like it's not a protracted conversation. This is a battle we've engaged in because you're trying it, to yeah, I mean, get it, stuff off it, me it, with menace. It's it's basically ma- malicious communication. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. so it, once it becomes malicious communications, then you've got them again. So, um, but you need to be communicating with them. And, and okay. also, when, when you communicate with them, it's in it's communicating with them personally, isn't it? Not through their uniform. <laughs> it's taking their name and, and making them personally responsible for the actions that they're taking. Mm. I think that's quite important. Um, I, I'm just aware that we we sort of a long time yes. on that one one Question. area of questions. Although it's very very interesting, just I'd like to. There's a number of questions there. Uh, just before we go, Gary, you were just telling us where we could find more information about that particular thing. That would people might want to drop that down. Can you just tell us again? If they read, if they if they read all about the postal rule agreement of 1977, it's all in there. It explains what the post is. It explains that when a letter goes into a post box, it's classed. 
Foster's delivered um, uh, and and all the other things that are involved. So post war agreement, you, you'll find everything there. Brilliant. Thank yeah. you very much Thank for you. that. Um, I've got an, a question here that's uh, come in. It's been a long time waiting. Let me just read this uh, from Jim, who says, question, what is the best way of dealing with a dishonest executor of a will or is your only opinion to go through the very expensive solicitor route? So, in other words, is there another route uh, on an ex dealing with a dishonest executor? He says. Um, we sort of touched a bit on that when Pete was on the show um, earlier this week. I think it was. It's been a long week, um, and we were talking about trusts um, and saying when you go through a solicitor, you're having an agreement with somebody else who then may report it to the HMRC in that case can I just what, ask, you... can I just ask dishonest, dishonest in what way as an executor because the they, they last one in testament and, and anything put down by the person that had that estate would be actually defined within the will itself so what does it mean by a dishonest executor what does I'm it mean? wondering I'm wondering because he's saying dealing with a dishonest executor so somebody may have been appointed as executor of somebody else's will and perhaps they are not as ideal as perhaps the you know the most honest person and then it's saying or is your opinion to go through an expensive or, or whatever as a solicitor it, it, it doesn't need to be expensive or you can put a freeze on the will for six you can put a freeze on a will for six pounds and then they then have to uh, deal with you to get that removed and then therefore you can then start the correspondence with them that come under contestation yeah. Yeah. Contestation, yes. So for six yeah. pounds, that's so, that's quite incredible. That's, that's only that's only six that's it, that's only six pounds. And um and that puts a, a, a kibosh on the whole process. And if if there is an executor that's that's misbehaving, then it's up to them to try to get you to remove your claim, but they may have to prove everything that you are the one that wants to question what they're doing. Um, so that's the quickest way of doing it. And you can do it over the phone. Right. Wow. With So would you have to identify yourself then? I mean, over the phone, you'd have yeah, to surely... Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Here's, here's another little thing that um, um, a, a couple of us are, are, of us are, are, are thinking about is these people in public office who misbehave, when their loved ones die, i.e. their parents or, or, or money's coming in their direction, all we do is we put a freeze on their inheritance. And <laughs> to, 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 un, to undo that takes about six months. Well, if right. you've got 30 people locked up and every time they remove it, someone else does a six pound entry into freezing, they'll never get their money eventually. And then we start causing them personal pain yes um um with with wills so all these the, all these people in public office and and what have you even if a, a house is in trust you can have you can have the will frozen you can have it frozen for the asset um to be discussed and and if you've got 30 40 people with with let's say let's say a, a, a politician or as i call them a misleader um yeah we could cause havoc in their world using these things you use yeah, all their yeah. rules against them gosh that bleak I, house. <laughs> I like that i like that uh, oh, another God. question oh, sorry. all right just say bye bye thank you jill bye. thank you very much look forward to seeing you bye bye thank you bye bye, bye. um yes yeah, so let's go on to another question then karen okay so what? there's two lined up here um this is from no name i have been returning letters unopened to the council with not known at this address what happens if i do the same with court summons letters i think we kind of answered that already but anybody want to make a comment on it you must get a warrant for your arrest and they'll come looking for you yeah essentially that's what will most likely happen if you keep ignoring it they'll put a warrant out for your yeah. arrest so and reply to everything basically you said that well yeah like i said always engage with them it's best it's best to really because you can, you can actually, like I say, you can create joinder with them, and like I say, and then engage them in the conversation. And then, like most of the time, you can educate them in stuff that they didn't even know. Mm. That's what I find half the time, because then, and half these people are even legally trained when you talk to them, even though they're sat in a legal office, and you're like, well, I'm telling you this, and I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. And it's like, well, shouldn't you have known that? 
I, I, I have great I have great joy because I hand to the police and the senior council officials and I just send them copies of my books. <laughs> Do you charge them? <laughs> which, which is send no, them an invoice. Is a gift. You might find it useful, but um, right. But yeah, when, when you hand this stuff out and uh, and and their faces are largely confused at first, um, but occasionally, you know, we might we might get one of them to think about what they're doing. It only takes one. If we can rescue one out of 100, then, sure. then that's that's fair game. Um, Gary, a lot of these say, people... Can, I was just going to say, can you say what book it is? Because it could be like, it's not your count books, is it? It's just the book that you've written. So can you just say what it is? Uh, it, it was putting the stopper in the bottle of death. I think uh, Richard's been on, had me on the show with that one. That's about words, and the second book's about numbers, and my my third book's about to come out, which is the New World Order and the Adepts uh, and the real history of humanity. All wars are about banking. Um, so, so yeah, I like I love spreading this uh, this knowledge um, to these people that are, are are almost robotized into their positions of um, disdain for the for the mops members of the public mm. if i would got your book handy i would have um, flashed it up on the screen for you to in increase the sales but uh, do look for the video that we did with gary and it's uh, there's a link to them um i still occasionally get emails from people saying oh you're giving away gary's book and it's like that was like six months ago yeah. Anyway, uh, Karen, the other question. What yeah, was the, the other question was, do most of these remedies for stutter apply in the US? I don't know if you guys know the answer to that one. Is that the answer? America. Do they apply in the United States, these remedies? Well, they would actually go down to the US, uh, the US, the UCC codes, essentially. So they'd have to look at the, their actual statutes under the UCC to actually see where it applies. I expect there'll be a lot of com a common similarity because you're dealing with common law and they actually do as obviously the common law over there to still have the grand juries, thankfully. Uh, but like I say, so I'd expect there'll be a lot of crossover and similarity with within that uh, the law, but you'd have to look up the uh, the universal uh, codes as well, the UCC codes, to find out which ones would stipulate the this, this same remedy, essentially, or the same outcome. And it, and that it, you could get uh, yeah, so you could get state to state. I mean, Sorry, Gary. No, it, it varies state to state as well with the UCC. Uh, again, there's there's all sorts of other issues. I mean, but you've only got to look at the amount of uh, um, chaos in our political setting at the moment, never mind all the problems we have with the council tax and what have you. If you think about it, we've got over 600 MPs in the House of Frauds. Uh, oh, sorry, House <laughs> of Non-Commoners. Um, and, 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 don't, and don't forget that you... The, you <laughs> The UK is is the size of Utah. Well, in America, you have two sitting um, senators for each state. We've got six over six hundred for the size of Utah, and and look at the mess that they're creating. I mean, mm -hmm. our our political sewer is just it's broken. The whole thing's broken. Okay. Grand. Okay, so that was that question. I've got one here. Um, yeah question it says i've had an hmrc letter stating that i owe 1800 pounds i think that must be from five years ago and i've been working through the agency on ir35 paye and cis which get my tax stopped before payment i've even had rebates for overpayment that's not so much of a question as more of a statement i think so uh, that's, yeah, that, that's interesting. That, that was that's interesting. Maybe, well, maybe, maybe they well, want to know if they have to pay it. Well, they're trying to claim that you've actually earned money outside of the actual PAYE because that's the only time they could actually claim anything above and beyond what you've already been registered to pay actually for a company or a, 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 another employer. So yeah, it's it it, uh, it depends basically if they've actually been notified of you doing any work outside of that, which they want to collect upon. Mm. But, uh, so, well, yeah, so... I, I do, I do know a couple of people that their bosses have been quite fair with them, and they said even though they're in, they're in pay as you earn. Um, um, what they've done is they basically said with, uh, that they're withholding their tax unless the British government can pr prove that they're not uh, um, acting as terrorists, and and they're they're paying their tax into an escrow account that's protected 
with a solicitor that's, that will release the money once they're satisfied that, that British politicians aren't, um, aren't involved in terrorism. Yeah, it's so, like a conditional acceptance, isn't it? You're actually setting up the conditions and you've got a, an impartial person there actually taking yeah. control of, of the decisions that are made and the agreements that they come to are based on... But everyone, everyone that's refusing tax to pay tax, it adds more and more pressure to them. So it's about numbers. It's about large numbers of people saying, we're not doing this anymore. Yeah, like I said last week about creating a dominion, we need to create dominion so we can actually put that pressure on. Presumably, I mean, the, not only the HMRC, but council tax particularly, must be feeling a huge amount of pressure in the last three or four years as more and more people are beginning to sort of realise what's going on and the legality of, uh, for want of a better word, or the lawful or the unlawful nature of where the money's going and how it's being done. I mean, we've seen many councils saying you can't use the freeman of the land as an excuse to try and deflect, I suppose, these types of arguments, just give us the sodding money and we'll be happy type thing. So th the pressure must be building on the government institutes that are collecting money. Yeah, absolutely. And the more, more people join in, um, um, the, the, more problem, the more of a problem they have. Um, mm. it's about numbers, sheer numbers. Provided they're, they're I mean, it, it all comes back to being prepared for the, for the, you know, knowing how to stand in your, in your, I don't know how to phrase it, but to stand in your standing, as it were, so that you, you know, you're not just going, oh, well, I'm not going to pay because I want to help everybody else. And then when the bailiffs or whatever happens, not know how to approach, you've got to under, you know, you've yeah. got to really get to grips with it because you can be, in a lot of hot water or frightened very easily oh absolutely absolutely yeah. but you, you know i've been in this over 20 years and um drop the fear drop the fear and and then start having fun with it mm. don't treat you, it you... like uh, with trepidation and oh no i've got to write a letter you should be looking forward to writing the letter and having a bit of fun putting you i you know putting that in terms like um um i don't know merry christmas you know get them to look stuff up you know, get them to, to say, you know, would you look after my chickens on a Thursday? But write it in Latin. You know, really, did have, fun. I, really I did. have some fun with it. I interviewed Robert O'Deck, who's got the app out, and uh, he said that it can produce these letters to, to go back uh, to all these different departments and places. But he said not only can you have write the letters, but you can write them in the style of Dick... Um, oh, Dick uh, Dickens... Of uh, Dickens, or you can write, you know, you can write them in a sort of uh, dramatic style, just to have a bit of fun. It's got all the, the necessary wordage in there, but it's just in the Charles Dickens, you know, good day, my dear fellow. I wonder if you could assist me with this slight problem I have, type thing. So uh, that all sounds quite fun. But you say drop the fear. That's not an easy thing, is it? No, no, it takes years. It takes years, but but. When you lose so many battles and then you win one, then the fear starts to cut, drop off right. you. Because you're like, yeah. oh, I've had, I've had a win, which is a rare thing when you first start this stuff. But when, when you start getting the wins and you start understanding how their energy works and, you, and you're, you're, you're basically re reversing their, their negative energy onto them, um, mm. it's like how you – like narcissists. There's a really good book to deal with them. Um, Social psychopaths written by uh, Thomas Sheridan, and it's called Puzzling People, and that's a fascinating book on how to deal with social psychopaths. Um, it tells you their traits uh, to identify them and then how to deal with them. Yeah, pu puz Puzzling People by Thomas Sheridan. That's that's worth a read. Oh, that's another book on my bloody list. Of yeah, <laughs> um, well, I shall end up. I know from my point of view, is uh, I. It was through my journey, basically, before I even went into the court and actually, you know, got that confidence to go in and speak my mind, was understanding what how the law works and then finding these loopholes that they use to literally jump through. And like I say, once you start realising that, you actually go through a cognitive paradigm shift. Like, I went through one, basically, when, when I, I learned certain things, I was like... So they are allowed to do that and that to do that and they are allowed to do that and legislation actually backs up that they can't do it anyway. And if you go back far enough to the original agreements that was made, they don't have the authority to make that to make that decision anyway. 
And it was mm. it was things like that that made me mm. go, hang about. So these people are just no different to me, you know. They're just, you know, to lack of a better term, we all shit and stink the same. Mm. Speak for yourself. Yeah. Um, Karen, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, can you um, do the oh, next you... question? And I'd ah. like you just to hold the fort and carry, you know, get somebody else. I've got to go and put a log on the fire talking about <laughs> things, so I'll just disappear for a second. Sure thing. So, um, sorry, my dog's just joined me as well. This this is um, not a question, it's more of a statement, but I'm sure it's one that you guys can talk about. Um, and hopefully Pete's still there. Are you still there, Pete, by the way? You're very quiet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're still there. Maybe you want to answer this one or talk about it. It says, when you give the banks your money, it then, it then becomes theirs, not yours. I mean, what do you think about that one? 100%. If you look at bank and laws, there's no such word as a deposit. As soon as you actually give your money into a bank, they have it. You have made a loan to the bank and they can do whatever they want with it. Now, forget about all this nonsense about like when they're saying fractional, fractional reserve banking and lending and all that. If you give them your money, they have it. And there is no, I don't even like legal, by the way. Right? I'm completely <laughs> quiet, probably because I'm going far more into lawful than legal. But there's no legal requirement for them to give you a penny back. Fair comment. Fair comment. Would you, would you have a, anybody else like to comment on that as well? I think that's a great answer. But Gary, Gary? All good. All good. All good. Okay, we'll move oh. on to another one. Well, um, no, the only thing the only thing I would add to that is as soon as you give them it, that, that they can actually use 90% of that to actually loan somebody else with. So they, that's what happens with it anyway, because... Like you know, like Pete said, it comes in. They create a deposit. It's, it's it's given to them, and like I said, then they can use that amount and lo actually loan out ninety percent of that. And, and then I think we've also got to understand where money comes from because it's not even it doesn't even exist anyway, does it? Really, it's just well, you know. no. This this is one thing that I've always said about basically when they said, oh, well, you know, people have asked me to say, if you was going to do an economy guy and actually bring out a financial system, how would you do it? And I goes, well, everybody keeps going on about gold, but they don't, they don't ever talk about, uh, they go, oh, this is gold-backed currency, gold-backed currency. I was like, well, if if you're actually talking about gold all the time, why don't you give people gold money? So put assets in the pocket instead of money. And that's what I've always said. You could actually create notes, yeah, no, basically, basically like, like, you know, to the value of the demand on the front. But then it's an asset rather than money. So I said, why would you put money in people's pocket? Why don't you put assets in there? So. Yeah. And I've always said that instead of, of, of a currency. If you wanted a currency, why have money at all? Have an asset in your pocket. So have actual gold money, essentially. And you could actually do it like we have fives, tens, twenties, and fifties now. You just do it to the value of the front. So you so then as gold rose in price, so would the value of the asset in your pocket. So why would you have money when you don't get any busy interest on it or any value from it when you could have an asset in the pocket and then as soon as that fluctuates, you're, you're earning interest in your pocket from the assets that you hold. You've just become voted as the new Chancellor of the extra Exchequer, well, it'd just be, Gary. It would just be easier, wouldn't it? Because the, why would you give people money when you could put an asset? Because, oh, go back, go back digital currency. Well, how can it be? Because as soon as they turn the, the actual computers off and the energy goes down, where's all them ledgers? They've all gone. So what is it backed by? Nothing. It can't mm. be backed by gold because you can't lay claim to what's owed to you because you don't have the ledgers anymore. So basically, yeah. that's why I've always said if you're going to have a, a, a financial system or a monetary system, then you take away money completely, give people assets in the pocket and make gold, actual gold money, just like we do today, but like I say, like 5, 10, 20s and 50s, but just have it as the value of gold in that note. And silver, presumably, because you... Yeah, you could do silver as well, but you could have yeah. coins as basically for, just to say, if you just went in with 20, uh, to a 20, uh, a 20, like a 20 pound gold note, and it was only like 950, it could give you 50, 50 pence in silver. Mm. I mean, we so used to have, So they could give you change for it. We used to have pieces of eight where you could, uh, well, we had pieces of 16, where you exactly. could have a coin and break into eight different pieces. Exactly. Or break it into Thank 16 you. different pieces. And the same with silver. So pieces of eight existed for a long time until the crown got involved and and thought, oh, we can't have them making their own money. We And then the bills of exchange and all the rest of it. And the rest is history, as we know. Mm. So it, it, it's been done. Nothing nothing we do is, is new. 
But I, I love the fact that you can just have the money as an asset and it's earning money in your pocket without doing anything. You haven't got to put it in a bank and get them to give you the interest and all of that. You, exactly. you just do it. Exactly, uh, Richard. That was good. And this is where you actually make somebody sovereign because then they are sovereign because they have an asset there. They don't deal with money anymore. Money, mm. money, like I say, money has no value anywhere other than what you promise to, uh, you know, bear on demand. But you're not bearing anything on demand because the, it's like I know money years ago, they did have a platinum strip in it, so there was a value to it. Yes. But it's like I know now, it's like if I go to my money jar now, Richard, seriously, I can tell the difference between older money and new money because old money still has precious metal in it. And if everybody can try this, get a magnet, literally, and you put your change on the top and you put a magnet over it and you'll tell me basically how much is magnetized because basically you'll find about, unless it's an old coin, which still has precious metal in it, which isn't magnetic, no precious metals are. So, and like I say, our money now is magnetic, so it's just metal. There is no mm. value to it. There are no value in it all. And anybody can do this now. If you've got a magnet, take some change out of your pocket and you'll find, basically, that that money is magnetic, which means it's ferrous, which means there's no value to it. So, first of all, take the magnet off your arm that you've had. You know, if you've had a jab and that magnet's got stuck to your arm, and then do it with the money. Um, that, yeah, no, I'd, I'd, I'm absolutely 100% with you. And when these CBDCs sort of threaten to come in, we could just go, uh, we don't need you. We're just... Yeah. dealing with 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 silver and gold and exactly yeah because it's an yeah. asset and like i said with asset as soon as you buy something you own it anyway but there it doesn't go. even have to be silver and gold it can be some sort of old-fashioned bartering couldn't it that are, you know a, a job tins of beans yeah, but, that's, yeah, yeah. but that's what that's what you can actually do with the money itself like i said because yeah. it's an asset so you can barter with it because you can say well the actual exchange rate basically on gold today is this so this five pound gold note is worth six and a half quid so I can now battle with you for that. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. It gives you that anyway. And then you get a bill of exchange with them because you're you're giving that asset at the price, uh, at the value that it's worth. So whilst talking about money, this this chap, Matthew Miller, asks apparently or says, apparently purchases um, with currency, whether it's digital or physical, doesn't make the purchaser the owner due to the currency used being an IOU, which is, I guess, that promissory note. Yeah, what, the bear, what, pay the bearer on demand. That's exactly. what I'm saying. But what evidence exists that currency was used as payment? I guess there isn't any. Well, isn't, I, I remember Sovereign Pete telling me that uh, if you've got a £10 note, it, it's not yours, it's the Bank of England's, which is a company. Mm. And so everything you buy with that £10 note isn't even yours, it's... It belongs to the Bank of England, really, technically. Not that they're going to come and grab that Mars bar that you've just swallowed. <laughs> Not that I recommend eating confectionery. Just stick to good quality farm food. Yeah. Um, but if that's what you've done, you, you know, uh, that's what uh, Sovereign Pete, if I haven't misinterpreted what he said, which is very easy for me to do, um, because it's not your own. It's not yeah. your own asset. It's not your own. Whereas if you bought it with your own gold, if you bought your house with a big lump of gold, it's your house because you've paid for it with an asset, not somebody else's trick, monopoly nonsense. Yeah. Wow. If I've got that so right. That's the point where, where you can actually sell anything and everything you want to do by using equity because there is no money. There's never been money for a very long time. We're going to argue about the dates of it between the First World War and the 1930s. But they re they removed any value or any tie in with what this what you're calling money. Money doesn't exist. You only have currency, and it is fiat currency which has zero value. And because of what they did, and you tie in with what we're doing with the Bills of Exchange Act, and when they actually removed the the gold and silver, which was for the First World War in the UK, they also did in the 1930s in the United States where they actually took all the gold and silver. Not a lot of people even know that, that they took the gold and silver from people in the UK for the First World War. No one ever speaks yeah. about that. They yeah. actually and send out demands, fact, give us your gold and silver now, right? They only fact, talk about it in the United States. They did it in, in the UK, or let's say England, for the war, right, for the First World War. But, like... In equity, when you look at the true version of equity, you can use equity to settle everything because you're only balancing books because it's all fake 
numbers. And all you ever do is balance the books by actually giving them a note, right? Not yeah, a, not set, the set, set the public day. Like, notes, by right, 10 pound notes. You actually create, create uh, uh, a non-negotiable note to put there and balance it in equity. Every single thing that you can ever find is in equity and you can discharge all of it. Um, Justin out there is saying Treasury notes are the only notes to be issued. HM Treasury also issue the coinage uh, using the same fiscal measures. So I think I know that Justin is a big advocate of the Bradbury Pound. If the government were printing the money, it would be different to this private corporation called the Bank of England, which sounds as if it's a part of the government, but it isn't. Yeah, well, I, would, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't trust the government to do anything. No, I <laughs> do tend to agree with you at the moment. They've not been very, um, they've not been very nice. I mean, they're a corporation in and of themselves. Well, well they certainly haven't stuck to their trinity of virtue. Let's put it that way. Yeah, so um, I'd yeah. still go back to the gold and silver, personally. Well, yeah, but well, to... if they've stuck to the trinity of virtues, which is basically good faith, good character and good conscience, we we'll mostly won't be in this position anyway. But under the fiduciary position, that's what they're supposed to be doing because that is the be all end all of like the Dolan principles. That's where they come from, from the right. uh, from the trinity of virtues. They're supposed to have. Um, let's get some more questions in, um, okay. Karen. So uh, Miss with a hitch, uh, she asked to talk about money. So if a credit card debt is sold by the company, can you ignore the new company? No, you ask them why you actually no. they sold your data. You know, you can actually yeah. go to I the don't know on that is, one. Sorry. I did an, I did like, an this interesting... This is what it's people saying, oh, because it's your legal fiction, ignore them. You've got nothing to worry about. But if you ignore your legal fiction, you have become the, the, the actual... Um, they, they make you stand in for the legal fiction. So you can't ignore it. You're still going to get a CCJ. You can actually get rid of it very easily, extremely easy, right? But like, you can't ignore it. It's like sticking your head in the sand and not expecting to get kicked up the arse. <laughs> nice gentle terms on the oh, show. Oh, oh, it's I, 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 I had an Let's go one at a time, lads. Uh, Gary Fraun. Um, yeah, I, I had an interesting one with a credit card company. Um, basically, it, I owed some money and it was all getting a bit hoo-ha and I decided to go down the religious route. So I basically asked them the question, um, as I am as I, I believe in the creator, um, can you tell me why there's a dove on the back of my credit card? And that conversation ended up really interesting because I don't know if people know this, but in the Bible, um, uh, um, Jesus was said to have thrown out the money lenders and the legalists. From the temple well the poor the rich used to sacrifice oxen once a year and the poor would have to borrow money and sacrifice doves and that's why there's a hologram dove on the back of your credit card it means you're all poor wow. so i started to go down the road that why are you subjecting me to anti uh, religious and religious hate speech um, <laughs> with the cards that you're giving everybody. And, um, yeah, the, it went away. <laughs> Fantastic. It's amazing, isn't it, the different angles that you can go at it at, mm. which is brilliant. Well, well, it's the same Paul that they actually put on your passport because the actual P on your passport means have a, a, a well, prisoner or a pauper, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the P on your on your actual passport. And yeah, if you look it? at your passport and the actual number at the bottom, it starts with a P. And that, and also you have a P on the passport itself. And that stand, actually stands for either prisoner or pauper. Yeah, diplomats have a D and and, and the royal family have an R. What's the uh, D for? For, for Regis. For Regis. And the D? The D for diplomat. diplomat. I can, yeah, well, or, or another word, like short, short name for you, Richard. Dickhead. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for that. Yes, thanks. No, you are not. I didn't mean that to you, though, Richard. I do have uh, the ability uh, to boot you off, you know. You're definitely a dickhead. 
<laughs> dear, oh dear. Okay, I've got a question here from Ria, and it's the question is, how do you respond to single justice procedure from the council? I sent three notices and they refused to provide evidence I requested. Is it regarding refusing the refusing to satisfy education LA education. I'm not sure I understood what I just read, but um... always with the council do details. Don't don't muck around. Just do details. Uh, you 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 can write one polite letter and then do details, and 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 then start thinking of ways of having fun. If you can put fun energy into letters like I do, right. um, it's amazing what what happens at the other end. Because people do read Latin and, the, and you're, you're wishing them Merry Christmas and 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 yeah, just but have fun with it. Don't treat it like it's it's an awful thing. Um, but again, you've got to be in this fight for a long time to start having real fun with these um, with these maniacs. But but I feel quite sorry for them really. So uh, so yeah, I'll have a bit of fun at their expense. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, I've, got, I've got a question here from I Function. So I function has just got a copy of Black's Law Dictionary and in it a person is stated as a human being. So now I'm confused about the person thing. They have to look at human edition? being. What edition have they got? What edition, yeah. Yeah, uh, what edition what have edition they got? I, function? I bet that's uh, 11. Oh. No, it makes a big difference because anything after the fourth edition you might as well not have. Okay. Which is a nuisance because I spent a lot of money on edition number 11, realising as as I'd heard all these things that a, a, a person or a human rather is a monster. And then I looked in the 11th and it's like, oh, this has been sanitised. Well, like I said, it's a, my personal, uh, opinion, uh, personal opinion that that, that, Black's, that Black's Law Dictionary 4th edition is one of the best ones, but especially for, big, for the character, category and definition. Yeah. So what's but the, what's the 11th edition... The 11th edition is really useful for people of colour because in there it's got driving while black and people can use that, the people of colour, not Caucasian, but they can use that in court to say, why are you, why are you dealing in religious space, um, religious and uh, uh, racial uh, hate speech in the legislation that you're using and the language that you're using? Wow. What do you mean by driving while black? So with, with, with driving offences and you're of colour, then that's a really good out clause for people to use, and that's in the 11th edition. Oh, interesting. So you get the 11th... Is that the latest, or is there something after the 11th? No, there's, there's been loads of updates. There's, there's, right. there's the numbers after that. But the ones to go for really are 4, 5, 6 and 11. Yeah, 4, four is one I go with because 4 is brilliant when it comes to the archaic meanings as well because they've got a lot of the etymology in that as well in uh, in the 4th yeah. edition, which is brilliant. It's a lot bigger, but like I say, it's, it's definitely worth it. Because, like well, say, that's, why get... that, that's why that, that one's got a key on it because that's got a lot of answers to the to to the solutions. It, exactly. It, if you're going to get an edition, get one with a key on it uh, that's printed on the front cover. A T? A key. Yeah, like a, you know, a house key. A house key. Oh, a key. Print. Sorry, I thought yeah. you said a. I, I thought, thought you yeah, said a tea. Yeah, like a nice cup of tea. No, no a key. 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 No a key. Get a key on it. Um, some a Dorian Gray says, um, "What is a person?" Stroud's Judicial Dictionary states a person is an artificial entity, a corporate soul, corporate soul, um, a legal fiction. I didn't think a corporate could have a soul. No. But legal no. fiction. How are they spelling yeah. stall though? How are they um, spelling the word stall? Well, it's spelled here, whether it's um, the same as they've done in the book, in the dictionary, S O U L. Oh, that's that, yeah, actually in the source. They're talking song, about a corporate stall, they're talking about a, corp a corporate sole proprietor, is what they actually mean. I um, see. Which, again, is, it's, it's all the same thing. It is not man. Right. And all you ever have to be, if you want to be anything from council tax to anything, just stand as man. And the thing is, you never, I mean, you know, it seems an obvious thing, but you, whenever you get these legal documents, it never says to you as a man. It never, you know, man is never in there, is it? No, because they get to accept the pseudo trustee position by accepting the name. Yeah. It's the same but thing I'm, they do in court. When you go in court, basically, they, they get you to, get, to give your name and your 
date of birth to accept the pseudo the trustee position, which is a pseudo trustee position, which makes you a, a trustee to son talk, which makes you an imposter, which makes you guilty in their eyes because you're seen as morally, uh, morally and uh, spiritually insolvent. Yes. No, I, I, I suppose what I was really getting at is once you know that you are a man or a woman and you don't see it on any of these documents, you you, you realise it's not for you. It's It starts to become bleeding obvious because they're using every other weird term well, to well, describe that's the, it. Well, that's the cognitive paradigm shift that was on about. Is yeah. Start learning more and more of it. You're like, I'm about then. So if this is the actual case, and this is what it says actually in law, and what they're sending me here doesn't actually uh, corroborate or correlate to what I know to be true, then this can't be for me. Yeah. No, and, but yeah. that's, what, that's what takes away a lot of the fear as well, because yeah. you actually know the, like I call it, tactical civics, because you're being tactical about what you understand about the law and actually applying it to what they're giving you. Once you can, once you actually see, hang about, so this is what's true. This is what they've sent me, which actually doesn't actually fit, you know, fit with the reality of what they sh what should be done in the law itself. And like I say, that's what gives you that, like say for me, took away a lot of the fear and gave me a lot more confidence to actually, you know, go ahead on with them and go, well, actually, no, because mm. it says right here, which we can prove, actually in law, and I can send you this, that it says right here that the contrary is true. So uh, here's an interesting observation, I suppose, and question. So uh, this is from Shoes of Joshua, who says, um, so what's human rights laws all about if we're not human? No, well, you don't want to be law. human, and you don't want human rights. No, because you're a monster That's as a point. human. You don't want to be human, and you don't want to be human rights because you are man. So right. no, give them back the human rights. Give them back any rights that you want because you have man. That's it. That's the whole point. And they're tricking you all the time by taking into these legal titles. Human rights is a legal title. Why should you take a title from anybody? They're giving you the like. You know, think about that film. What do you call it? Braveheart. Right. And, and and what's his name? Like who was playing like uh, William Wallace? He said, you're too busy arguing from the scraps of like the king's table. You've forgotten what you are. Mm. We are man. So stop arguing about the legal rights of things, which is the scraps of the table of the king. That is the fake king that is the legal king and realize that you're actually man from the creator and you don't have to worry about anything else. You've also, got to you've, you've also got to realize where the word human came from it's when when of the seven um the seven challenges to jerusalem um um were happening um the the, the particularly the french knights as they were passing through europe uh, on their way to 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 araby and 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 um Aqaba, they were creating illegitimate children and the pope was getting really scared that these illegitimate children would be creating uh, a debt problem for when the knights returned or or if the children made a claim on the uh, estates of these knights so the pope made the declaration that these these uh, children that were being created were being human and then the legalists swapped the two words around and then became human being so it's a really negative word and we shouldn't be using it well, it, does the, it does say in the bible as well in job uh, basically, it says, "Do not accept any titles or persons." It actually, says it right there in the Bible. <laughs> Literally, yeah. it says it under Job. Do yeah. not accept any titles, any persons or titles. It says right. it right there under Job. Yeah, if you look it up in the Bible under Job. It says it. Do not accept any persons or titles. But we don't need human rights because if 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 under common law, hurt, harm, and injury covers everything. That covers everything. We don't need mm. we don't need all these books, legislations, and God knows what. Um, and precedence, hurt, harm, and injure. We, if you get that right, then all, all fair and well and good. And and I, I was having a chat with someone at the weekend, or there was a group of people I was doing a chat to, and uh, people don't realise the word testify when it comes from, because women could never be trusted, because a woman would 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 lie to protect a child, and that's the story of uh, King Solomon. Solomon, yes, the, I was about to say Solomon. The, the, about, so the, real, the child the in real, half, yeah. Yeah, so the real mother, a, a, a woman, um, a, a, according to the ancient rules, a, mo a mother would lie to nurture because that's in their very that's in a woman's nature to nurture, 
whereas a man is the hunter-gatherer. But if a man who was allowed to give evidence was and found to have lied, they'd remove his testicles. That's where the word testify comes oh, from. Yeah. Ouch. It's, gonna yeah. Say, yeah. it's easy for you to say, ouch. Yeah, I haven't even got any. <laughs> I've had them testified. Uh, <laughs> Test and fried. That's um. That's not so good. Like your sausages, Richard. Yes, I did have a sausage. Um, if you here's a question, changing the subject somewhat. Uh, if a bank sold your mortgage to another financial company, is there an obligation to pay the new company since no. there's no contract with it? No, no, no. They pay. They pay the mortgage for you. Fantastic. Oh, let's do that. Roll on. Does it happen very often then that um, a bank sells on a mortgage? Yeah. Every day. Oh. Every day. Every so day. People... The bank sells the mortgages every single day. As soon as you actually sign the mortgage contract, they've already sold it to another bank. And it is, it's perfectly true. You don't have to actually pay it, but you don't have to pay it anyway because you never even have, have, have borrow any money because what you've done is you've actually signed a promissory note. And a exactly. promissory note is you've then created sold, credit. So you never borrowed any money anyway. Yeah, you've actually well, you've created, created that. You've created, <laughs> that. You've created that fund. But they do pass it on. They pass it on immediately. The difference is you standing on it, which we know is what is true, right? You, you, we know it's true. You you owe nothing, but then try and tell all of them scumbags, which was the biggest reason why I actually got into this stuff anyway. It was back in 2007, and I literally lost everything. And I mean, everything, including my own home, was living in a car. Right. So, you know, but like then I watched the videos and seeing all these people getting dragged out of the houses by police because they couldn't afford the mortgage. And I was like, I, I, hang on. What are the police doing dragging people who can't afford stuff out when it's like not a crime? You know, this is why I actually got into this and started delving in, really finding out what the uh, bills of exchange was and what the like the actual financial conduct authority is now compared to what it was then and going about these financial rules because then you find out it doesn't really bloody really matter anyway because there's only one corporation that exists. Only one. And it can be any government in the world. And they, and you, you stop paying the mortgage, it's the same corporation that's going to steal it if you don't pay for enough food at Asda. They, they, it's the same people own everything. So it's all absolute nuts. But... Yes, they, they sell it immediately, right? But they only sell the square bit, which is what's called the note, the promissory note that you actually signed thinking that it was actually a mortgage application, but it's not. It's actually a security instrument that then gets securitized, posh name for being sold, on the securities exchange later on. Hmm. There you go. Hey. Um it's, it's it's i mean you know again another learning it, everything is is the great british mortgage swindle swindle as dorian gray said yeah i mean we're, we're michael you know, Obanissian, people, yeah, I, yeah. People, have you looked into that richard what he actually did about the great british mortgage swindle and, uh, um i did I, I did have him on the show uh, although we were talking about some slightly different things but um yeah i mean he, he kind of exposed it didn't he yeah well especially when it comes to the fraud and how they actually uh couldn't act, um show by three ledgers back where the money came from and that was one of the uh, tracks that he used to actually show the fraud that they was doing because he said well if i've actually borrowed this money where have i borrowed it from can you show me at least three ledgers back where this money originated from so you can prove to me that it was the bank's money you lent me right and that was one and of the ways he got them yeah and they can't do it they can't no no because yeah. they don't have it because like i say it's like Peter said there, the money is created by you, so you actually create the credit when you do that. They just, they just sell that by creating a ledger, by putting credit and debt, uh, debtor, and then you become the debtor for the credit that they use to then securitize. So they give you the debt. That's how they do it. So they so actually create two ledgers. If I mean, if one could somehow get this into a, a real genuine 100% honest court, and get all those bankers in there and say, right, okay, you, you've got to now prove all the millions of mortgages. They'd be completely and utterly bankrupt if they if they were forced into that, you know, if Martians came down and did it for us, as it were, or 
doesn't have to be Martians necessarily, but you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, but it's like Michael Obanissian said. He said that basically it didn't matter that he actually found all this out. He actually agreed with it, it, it basically with him, and he actually won, obviously, his cases from that. But then all of that got hidden, so nothing mm. became public knowledge. He had to make it public knowledge, otherwise it yes. got out at all. So, like I said, so, so it's, a, it's it's more of a case of if it when it is done, it's like he said, all the remedies that he actually put in place, they just kept saying, yeah, you're right, yeah, we're right, we'll do this for you and we'll give you that. But then they hit it, so you, you never got to hear about it in the you know the, in the general populace. Yes, yeah. Well, they don't want anyone to know, do they? Otherwise, that, not that their little get rich, get rich quick scheme is. Yeah, under. even though they know it's going on, that's the other, that's the other thing that Michael's pointed out that they actually know it's going on. Yes, but because of the amount of money that's actually being made, it's like the same with the, with the council. Actually, I worked out just on a a conservative amount if they're doing. Six thousand liability orders a month, all that say a thousand pound a piece, and then you times that by three hundred seventeen different councils. There is, you're yeah. talking anywhere, anywhere every year, close to a one point nine billion pounds. Bloody hell! They're not going to give that. Big they're not going to give that up that easy. <laughs> they're not going to give that up that too. easy. Well, that most of that basically goes into offshore accounts. Ten percent of it goes into consolidation fund, and the rest of it, they mostly just play around with it and say, "We're going to do this, that, and the other for you." But, but, but based on what we believe is needed in the infrastructure, so we still don't agree to it. They just start allocating it around. And from what I've seen in most councils, they have so many companies in that council that they could just literally ferry it out. And what I've been seeing is racketeering, essentially. Well, yeah, I mean, they they bought a, a ten million pound ferry company, didn't they, without any ferries? Well, you know, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and it's well, it beggars belief. I mean, we, but you've got to remember, we live in a country where if you don't pay your TV license, you go to jail. Where you can watch TV without a license for free, <laughs> for free. Yeah. That but is if free. You're in jail for a crime, and you're committing that crime while you're in jail. That's how ridiculous this country has become. Yeah, it's right there in your face <laughs> as well. It's literally right there in your face. Karen, okay, we got okay, another I've got we... a question from Roger uh, Manners. Um, as all acts of parliament refer to a person, does that mean the acts don't apply to men and women? Roger Manners. I know Roger Manners personally. Do you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, there he is. I know Roger. <laughs> all and right, Rog. <laughs> yeah, all right, Rog. So, sorry. <laughs> you got all excited, Gary. So yeah, sorry. It's just I know I've actually spoken with Roger basically about the the green energy uh, inventions that I create. So I also actually uh, design and develop green energy machines. Mm. And it's like and I've been discussing some of the stuff with Roger about it, and he wants to go forward with some of the ideas that I've, well, the machine that I've already built anyway. I built six all together. I feel like there's a show coming on with Richard for this one, Gary. Well, it's, yeah, it's just there's something else I do in my spare time. Is I actually I create green energy machines, and I spoke to Roger loads about it, but he knows that I don't want to actually let it out yet because I've created a closed-loop system, so once it's started, it basically powers itself. Perpetual wow. motion? No, it's not perpetual That's... motion. No, there's no, 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 no. no. Perpetual motion means I've got to build it, walk away, and it starts itself. That's what perpetual oh, motion means. Oh, I like see. I say, but, I, it's like, yeah, it's just even humans don't have perpetual motion because somebody else, like I did when I was born, somebody spanked me ass to get me going. So that's not even <laughs> perpetual motion because somebody else got me going. But well, going, when going, you, yeah, going back to yeah. this question. Sorry, sorry. You've all, all your excitement. Yeah, what was, as, the, what yeah. was the question oh, again? It was, as all acts of parliament refer to a person, does it mean that the acts don't apply to men and women? Well, it depends on 100%. the legislation. It depends on the legislation. No, from, it, no, no from their point of view, I'm just saying from their point of view. I'm just saying from their point of view, it depends to them on the legislation. I'm not saying that's true, but in their point of view, yes, they see legislation oh. basically as ha certain legislation as using the definition that you'd see in the Oxford English Dictionary. But this is where I have the argument with them to say, well, which definition are we using, mm -hmm. legal or the Oxford English? Because you can't swap and change both. So I agree there, definitely, Pete, that it's none of it. But in their mind, they, they see that person is interchangeable between unincorporated and incorporated and the individual in some cases. I'm not saying it is. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That... They, they say that 
they, as we call them, they, they, they yeah. would say all legislation will will kind of like uh, refer to one type of man or woman. But at the end of the day, there is only man and woman. And before that, right, we have like the zygote, which is where your creation, forget your birthday, and that's where you're actually agreeing, by the way, that you are a person. If you celebrate your birthday, you're actually celebrating that on the copyrighted Vatican calendar of Gregorian, by the way. So if you actually say my birthday is that, you've just told them you're a person by the Gregorian calendar. So stop telling everyone what your birthday is. Stop saying I am de, de, de birth or by this date because that means you are the person. Therefore, you are tied to the legislation. Therefore, you are contracted and have no excuse to make sure you pay your council tax. However, Right by standing there as man and woman and accepting that we are a creation of a miracle, which was created nine months before we actually became part of this realm, then we are the zygote, therefore we are the creation of the miracle, which is the creator. Tell us who is above us. Jesus. Tell us who can give us anything except that law of the law. Well, they say it's usually 290 days on average before the day he was born. This is why I usually use the 18th of March, 1975, rather than the one that the day I was registered on, because that's the day I was, I manifested it into, the, into reality, essentially. That was the day, essentially the day of conception. If you're, if you're reincarnated, There's your no original thing. carnation may have been 20 centuries ago. There's no such thing as reincarnation. It's like, if when I die, I can't reincarnate as this again, as Gary. So there's no, no such thing as reincarnation. You just can it from the actual oh, the soul okay. that, you, that basically animated the body in the first place. Hang on, let me just go and slap myself for being stupid. <laughs> um, what I meant to say was when I was incarnated into some human form and then incarnated a second or third time, the original incarnation <laughs> might have been some several centuries ago. Does that does that work? I mean, I know they won't accept any well, of that. Well, 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 well several metaphysically, yeah. legislation, right? The legal, legal is the most modern thing you've ever come up. What right. is law? Law is law. Legal, they invented it, what, 120 years ago or something? Legal is modern. Legal is man-made, right? Yeah. In fact, common law is man-made, right? You've got law, which is law. Then you come underneath, you've got common law, which people say, do no harm. It isn't. That's man-made law, right? Going underneath, you've got legislation, which is like very modern. They just made it up, like what, 100 years ago or so? So sod the legal, to hell with them all. They're all a bunch of twats anyway. <laughs> let's go back to just standing at law and let's be man and woman at law and let's look after each other with common decency, common sense, and you don't need common law. Mm. No, I mean this is this is the purpose of all of this, is to get this simple idea into and and forget all that complicated five hundred million lines of crap that's just been invented in the last, as you say, so that people kind of go, oh right, okay, because the more people that just stand in that power, then they've got no hope to do anything. I would say to Roger though, if he looks at the Interpretations Act. They'll actually find all about person and what it means. They're basically under their understanding uh, uh, in the legal term of what it means. So tell, yeah, tell just tell Rogers to look under the Interpretations Act, and he'll find he'll find all the definitions there, including person. So he can actually then show definitely that this is how I have to interpret it because this is the way it is interpreted under the Act itself. Mm. So to Roger, yeah, I'd say look at the Interpretations Act. To actually look at that definition and then you'll see yeah. how they define it mm. and if they're Stuart's... defining it that way then that's the way you use it Stuart O'Neill says on the back of that uh, slightly comical thing I think I said he says what if you die and come back to life are you reborn would it make a difference to birth rights that's a good I mean if you're being well, operated on and you snuff it no, and no. then you know a few minutes later you come back up and they go oh we've we've dragged you back well, no, because it, that happened to my sister. She was uh, basically stabbed twice by her, her, her first husband. He tried to kill her, and she nice died bloke. twice. She died twice on the operating theatre. God, basically, uh, yeah, from a bruised heart and a collapsed lung, and she died twice. But basically, it didn't make any difference when she came back because she was still 
the same entity within that body. If she'd have actually been replaced by <laughs> different a different entity, then no, they can't because she can't actually make claim to that to that person that they're referring to because they have no knowledge of who, who they are. So if she'd you'd, need, if you'd, you'd, you'd need a death certificate issued for you to become exactly. a one person, and then what would you do then? Go and get another birth certificate. And oh, I, yeah, cert a... I certainly wouldn't look, look like a uh, a sixteen month old child at my age, would I? Okay. With my new mm. birthday. No, I'll ask no. for you. No, it's a very. You've got a very strange disease there that's aged you rather rapidly, young man. Ben, yeah, Benjamin Button. <laughs> Benjamin Button. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Uh, it is an interesting question because I've often thought, you know, uh, twins, for example, are they two souls or do they share a similar space? And then you've got to consider Dolly the. Sheep. Well, well, sheep. Well, no, that, well, does, that mean, does that mean as a soul does a soul then pass on through you being cloned and there's all sorts of weird and wonderful things on the internet about cloned humans isn't well, there well no with twins they can't be the same because basically they've got different uh, fingerprints so even if they're identical twins they have different fingerprints because you know how fingerprints are formed in the in the womb basically yeah. uh, uh, it's by biometric pressure and basically, That's the right. biometric pressure is literally different for that side to that side, so they have different fingerprints. So well, you I can a, see them I as individuals. Talk, I did a talk on fingerprints a couple of a couple of weeks ago, and there's an interesting thing they can now they can now figure out from your fingerprints from the DNA what sex you are, what medication you're on, if you've been, had prophylactics being used during whatever you're doing, and um, and medications. They can figure that all out now from a fingerprint. And another interesting thing about fingerprints, which is um, something I'm working on with some other people, is healers all have swirls on their finger on their on some of their fingertips. Um, but social psychopaths have one particular pattern, and yes. uh, and so in in theory, you could identify a child's um, uh, um, energies, if you like. Uh, artistic people, for example, have certain types of fingerprints. So you could identify a child at birth, what their traits could be. Um, the question is, if you started to identify a psychopath, what do you do with that baby? So it's, it's, a whole, it's, it's, a it's, a whole, it's a whole question, but I'd be quite interested to get hold of the fingerprints of our politicians and some of these individuals that have, have harmed um, to see if there's something in it. Well, look, it sounds a bit Gattaca, that. Have you seen that film Gattaca, where they actually yeah. determine by DNA? Yeah. That's what that, that sounded a bit but like they, that, they, then. But they, tell, <laughs> they tell us in the movies, don't they? They tell us everything in the movies. I mean, one of the most religious movies you'll ever watch is Pulp Fiction. <laughs> and people look at that movie and think, what is he talking about? Well, well, it's about two wandering angels that are carrying out death for Matthias. Matthias has had his soul removed from the back of his head, which is why there's a plaster on it. Inside the case, which is opened at 666, there's a white glow, and Matthias is trying to get his soul back. That's what's going on in the movie. Yeah, it's like a Greek tragedy, isn't it? Yeah, anyway, but it's, uh, it's always a movie. I need to break... Yeah, I've got a question here. Hang on a moment. We, uh, Mike uh, Stott has just joined us. Oh, Mick uh, Stott. Hello, Mike. Mick, sorry. Mick, Mike. I, yeah, I've only got one eye, and I was reading with the wrong one. Um, <laughs> hello. <laughs> that's, that's my excuse. Um, Mick. Hello, Mick's a bit hello. Late. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. What about you, Richard? Are you OK? Yeah, very well. We've only got 15 minutes of the show left, so you've got to answer all the last questions. <laughs> hello, hello. I've got one for you, Mick. You where have you been? Where, where, why are you late? <laughs> Have you so got a note? <laughs> that wasn't the question. No, it wasn't. But this one is, okay, so from Torren Wade, says, I changed um, energy providers. I was also in credit. I was always in credit. And after I left, they said I owe them £35. The bill makes no sense and I complain, but they still say I owe it. What would you advise? That's like an auntie question in a magazine, isn't it? Well, that's, I'd first ask them to itemise basically where the uh, debt came from. Especially yeah. if you're using credit in the account, ask them to itemize where the debt came from in the first place. Is it an administration fee? Is it a cancellation fee? What kind of what kind of debt is it? If you haven't identified what debt it is, then you've already got a claim against it anyway. Yeah, 
Well, they just say, yeah, they say they, you know, they owe it for their own uh, thirty-five pounds. Didn't say anymore. But find out well, all about that. Then. Yeah, well, yeah, let's have to find out basically and, and where the debt's mm. come from. Is it an administration fee? Is it a cancellation fee? Where, where, what is that? What is the debt? Because if Leicester can actually prove it's due, uh, if it's true due or past due, then th there is no debt anywhere. So they have to uh, they have to itemize and actually distinguish what that debt is. Can't just say you owe us this. It was just like I could send you, you Karen. I could send you one and say you owe me five hundred pound. Do I? I say, no, but I could say that, couldn't I? I? <laughs> so it's I like can't. unless I actually say it is for this reason and this is that where it's been accrued. In that Where's case, you know, you know, like we we start to give like a list of our costs when we, you know, when we are fighting back and saying, well, if you're going to turn up at my door for trespass, it's two thousand pounds, or kidnapping, it's twenty thousand pounds, all these sort of things. How do we administer those debts to the people that are chasing us? Anybody? Tony Silence. Well. Well, we know we're, we've been told now to, to write down a list of our charges when people are coming knocking on the door. Oh, the fee schedule you're on about. Yes, yes. How, how, how do we implement that if they do come knocking on the door and say, well, you know, you were told you're gonna, we're going to charge you 200 quid. How do you get that? You send them an invoice, then you chase them, you take them to court? Well, yeah, you can, you can do it that way, yeah. And like I say, but you can then apply for the court if you actually do it on a 90-day uh, basically um, um, response. And actually, do your notice in between time to say you're going to collect on this. You put them in default, then you can go to the court and and ask ask them to create a liability order to actually collect upon it. So you can you Pres can actually do you can actually do the same thing, but you've yeah. got could to you do it over your own. You've could got you to do over a ninety day process, though. You've got to do the ninety day notices. So it's, so I know that I've done it that way. And like I said, basically, and then at the end of it, because we're in default, I can now go to the court and say I need a liability order based on this default. Did you get any money off from Gary? I'm, well, I'm still waiting for it, basically. Okay, yeah, but you're, you're still... going through the through. Well, yeah, because I'm actually because basically the house the house I'm living in at the minute is subsided because and the the people that are on the ground, the land itself, basically uh, are not actually dealing with the maintenance of the land, so I'm having to actually put them on. Basically, I'm going for the ninety day. Uh, now I'm at thirty days at the minute, but I know when it goes to the default, I can then apply to the court basically for them to actually look at the case. And then award me a, a, a basically a liability order to collect. Here's a, a moving on. We've only got a few, a few minutes left, I'm afraid. Um, here's a, an interesting question. My sister and I have two birth certificates as we were born on MOD land whilst my father was serving in the army. Do I come under military law, King's regulations? Well, I don't know if I'm. boxes have they got? How many boxes? How many boxes has the birth certificate got? Yeah, don't, don't have an answer for that. Um, well, it's either they're going to have 10 boxes or 17 boxes, and it'll be identical. So it depends on what year it was. But if it's got like 10 boxes, then the 10th box will actually have a line through it, not, not allowing you to put the real name in because that's your legal fiction. And 17 boxes will do the same. Right, so whichever one it is depends on what year it was, but it makes no difference, and it's got nothing to do with military law or anything. It's all a legal fiction, and it's all got crown copyright property on the crown, which is not the queen, but well, king or whoever wants it, fat fingers or whatever, right? Right, the crown corporation own it all. Don't mm. the Four Corners rule actually apply that when it comes to the Four Corners rule? It doesn't really matter that. because they make up their own rules, or don't they? Right, yeah, the four about corner rule covers everything, but like the, they don't actually give a shit about what the four corner rule is. You know, <laughs> when they give you your, yeah, if true. you buy, like say for instance, a limited company, you know they're abiding by the four corner rule because you get your sheet and there is no boxes, there is no lines, there's nothing that is abiding by the four corner rule. You get a bill, what's that? It's like, oh, forget the four corner rule. So we know what the four corner rule is, but look at the birth certificate itself. It's got like, you know, box upon box upon box upon box. There is no corners. You can't see the corners. We're coming to, to, to the end of the show. There's a question here that Julia sent me, but it's a, I think the answer would be quite a, a long one. Um, I just wondered if we 
can just give every of our, each of our panelists a chance to sort of promote anything that they're coming up or doing talks anywhere or anything like that before we all have to go. Let's start with Mike as um, uh, Mick, rather. It's that bloody one eye is going funny. Um, uh, well, Mick, we've barely seen you. I'm afraid. Well, you... Given the fact that I completely came into the show at the wrong time, I don't think I have the right to even uh, to, to advertise anything. But uh, I, uh, and and to be fair, listening to some of the other panelists, you know, um, they're far more. They have a lot greater expertise than I do in, in this particular arena. I, I specialise actually in mindset, and, and of course, anyone that wants to connect with us at the level of uh, learning um, some of the techniques and tools that are out there to help people with mindset, they only need to go to our website, which is www.spectrumtc.co.uk. So any, any anything like that, that, if anyone's any, interested in any of that, then more than happy to help with that. Okay, brilliant. Um, let's go through them. Gary, Fraun. Yes, mate. Uh, well, well, you and I are going to do a conference, aren't we? Or you're coming? We are. Uh, um, Lee, where are I? I'm just looking it up now. Uh, Leonardo Hotel, Milton Keynes, Sunday, 26th of May. Um, you're, you're, you're doing the first slot. I'm doing the compare and rounding up. Um, yeah, so if you go to alternativeview.co.uk, um people can we can meet people in the flesh which is always very nice but there's a, another bunch of speakers uh, um, um, which I think everyone will find terribly interesting um, and uh, I, I think we'll have a good day but um, and so yeah I'll, I'll see you there Richard. Fantastic I'm very much looking forward to that um, so um, what about Pete have you yeah, I mean, like the the only thing I would say is go to uh, claimistoreland.com. If you go there and uh, just get your free ebook, you have a person, but you are not a person, uh, and that'll do you. I'll help you out a little bit there, give you some information, and then obviously you get onto the mailing list and we'll give you some mailings. Uh, and, and tied to that, we actually have the uh, podcast, which I will be uh, hopefully very soon asking all these guys here to come on and have a chat with me. Fantastic. That well, I would say, I would say as well, I would advocate for going to actually his podcast as well, because I watched a couple the other day and they are really good. So, I, yeah, so definitely go to them. Brilliant. So you, Gary, as you're oh, there. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yes. Well, I'm just confirming, uh, uh, obviously, the event that we're starting out with Karen uh, for the 21st of July. I'm going to be talking to the uh, manager of the Meridian Centre sometime either tomorrow Hopefully, if he gets back to me, or the first week in May, so it'll be confirmed sometime in the second week in May. So I can obviously uh, tell Richard about the confirmation, and obviously Karen uh, obviously will help promote that as well because it, that's a part of her, uh, the tour that she's going on. So we're going to get that right. confirmed hopefully tomorrow, but uh, if not, it'll be the first week in May. Fantastic. Um, and over to you, Karen. Yeah, and on the back of that, um, Gary, I think Pete Wilson's coming, Sovereign Pete's coming, allegedly Dave is coming. So this is like the, the roadshow we're trying to um, create to take you guys all over the country. And um, the first one, or maybe the second, it depends on if we if we do one um, in London, but we have one on, on the 26th of May in Glastonbury at the Assembly Rooms. So that's all organised. Tickets are now on sale. We've got Pete the Hat, Gina Buxton, I'll be there, uh, Martin Geddes and David, um, also the known as the People's Lawyer. So uh, tickets are available. I think we can put the link on the bottom of Richard's, of this description. And I'd also like to promote uh, my 13th conference, I think. I've lost track of how many we've done. At Rise and Shine. So this is going to be at Hope Sussex. So it's a three-day camping event. Again, Richard's going to be there. Um, we've got all, all sorts of speakers, camping, music, food, workshops. Um, and if you go onto the freedomnetwork.co.uk, that's my website, the tickets and the details are there. Or you can always email me, kizzy63 uh, at pm.me for all the things I'm organising. And we're back next week, aren't we? We are, yes, next next Friday. So I'll try and get all those... Thursday. Next Thursday. I said we got it wrong last yeah. time, oh, just cocking it up again. Um, I'll try and get all those links in, but just give me a bit of time. So it'll probably be there hopefully tomorrow sometime um, because it's obviously not there now. If you're watching the rerun, that is. If you happen to be in the Swindon area, 
down there in Wiltshire and want to come to the Great Resist. I shall be talking there tomorrow. Uh, a bunch of other exciting people will also be talking about all sorts of things, which you may be interested in. Um, and that's the greatresist.net, I think it is. But don't quote me on that. Um, but uh, yes, I'm, I'm looking forward to this um, this lawful road show. I'm assuming there's a massive, great, big um, Winnebago or big bus that's unregistered with private plates with uh, no <laughs> driving license and, and all of that. You know, just <laughs> driving on the right hand side of the road and in, in the central reservation, standing in their own sovereignty, getting to the various <laughs> events. Wouldn't that be chaotic? <laughs> Um, and so big thank you to the wonderful panel, to our two Garys, to uh, Pete, to to um, Mick, and uh, that's it, yeah, that's the, all of them, to the wonderful uh, Karen, who's there, um, and to Julia, who's been monitoring, uh, moderating, I should say, in the chat. Thank you to her and giving me the odd message to say, don't forget this question. Um, and to you, the lovely viewer, for tuning in and watching and asking all those very interesting questions. So we'll be back next Thursday, same time, six o'clock UK time, till eight. And we look forward to that. So do save up your questions and we'll have another panel ready for you on this live show. And will you be in the studio next Thursday, Karen? No, but I'll be over here still. Just sunning it up on the Isle of Wight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's oh, well. nice. Never mind. Um, that's that's all good. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for watching, everybody. Uh, in the meantime, look after yourselves and uh, do as much research. Keep it in your head. Remember, you are man or woman and you're not in their legislation, so ignore the buggers. Um, thank you very much for watching. From everybody here, 